Hi everyone. Here we are, uh, ready to start on chapter five. Everyone should be finishing up unit one, our exam, um, and starting to read about viruses. Very timely topic. And uh, I'm going to go through and highlight some of the parts of the chapter that are really important. I'm going to spend a lot of time on viral synthesis on that step in the virus life cycle. Um, some parts I'm going to go through pretty quickly because they're fairly easy to figure out. Um, things like the viral shape and the structures. Uh, but the synthesis that requires we go back to our genetics um, and especially that puzzle that we started or that we finished the unit with. Um, so why is it important to understand viruses? Don't really need to say that. Uh, about 80% of all infectious diseases are caused by viruses. So that's primarily what you'll be seeing working in a healthcare field. So we want to have some understanding of um, how they work. The big debate is, are they living or not? We talked about this in class a little bit. Uh, there are two sides to that debate, of course, but no, they are not. They're unable to replicate independently outside of a host cell. They don't have metabolism. They can't maintain homeostasis. They don't meet those properties of living things, so no. Uh, and then the other side is, well, even though they don't exhibit cell processes, they can direct them. When they infect a cell, they take charge. Um, so once they take charge, are they cellular at that point? Uh, some people would argue yes. Uh, typically, though, they're more accurately described as either an active or inactive rather than alive or dead. Uh, we define them as obligate intracellular parasites. They can't live outside a cellular host. They have one goal, a productive infection. And for a virus, what a productive infection means is that I am replicating at my highest rate and passing on um, new virions to infect new cells. There are viruses that infect bacteria, so bacteriophages. And we've seen those a few times in our discussions. We'll look more closely at them. Uh, there are viruses that specifically infect plant cells and there are animal viruses, um, those that specifically infect animal cells, including human cells. Each one of these is specific for a certain type of cell. So not only are they specific to the organism they infect, but to what cells they can get in. For example, right now, the coronavirus, that is a respiratory infection. It can infect respiratory cells, uh, can't cause gastrointestinal issues, uh, doesn't get in any other way. It needs the correct portal of entry and the correct cell to attach to, the uh, correct cell surface type to attach to. So uh, table 5.1 gives a list of the properties of viruses. They are obligate internal or intracellular parasites. Uh, they're about 10 to the 31. That's one with 31 zeros after it, virus particles on Earth. 10 times the number of bacteria. They are found everywhere. And um, there is a lot of evidence that all of evolution, everything has really been directed by viral infections, um, they have had a huge impact on the development of living organisms. They are ultramicroscopic. Get that a typo in there. They're not ultramicroscopic. They're ultramicroscopic. They are not cells. They don't have all of the components needed to be classified as a cell, which the minimum required cytoplasm, a cell membrane, nucleic acid, DNA, uh, and ribosomes. They don't have a cell membrane. They don't have ribosomes. They have a nucleic acid, but it's not necessarily DNA. Uh, they don't independently fulfill all those properties of life. They do have a basic structure. So they are, do have organization, which is one of the criteria for living things, but it's not at the cellular level. They have a protein coat called a capsid that surrounds a nucleic acid core, so either RNA or DNA. Um, their nucleic acid can come in all sorts of different configurations, unlike all other living organisms that have double-stranded DNA. They can have single-stranded or double-stranded, either RNA or DNA, but not both. 
Um, let's see, they have high specificity for attachment to specific host cells. They multiply by taking over a host cell. They cannot reproduce on their own. They usually lack enzymes for most metabolic processes. So remember metabolism, the sum total of all the chemical reactions in a cell. Uh, every single one of those chemical reactions has an enzyme that catalyzes it or speeds it up. Um, viruses don't have those. They rely on everything from the host and they lack the machinery for synthesizing proteins, which for proteins, the site of uh, protein synthesis is the ribosome. They do not have ribosomes and they don't have a way to get the amino acids and the raw building materials. So we'll look at exactly how they take over and what they do here uh, when they do infect a cell. So I'm not going through all the learning outcomes because this PowerPoint presentation is a hodgepodge from two different sources. Um, our book does a good job explaining viruses, uh, but I liked some images and I liked some of the explanations in a previous textbook. So I've incorporated bits and pieces. Um, the learning outcomes in section 5.2 are, are really important. Know the parts of a virus, what makes up a virus, um, and be able to diagram the different configurations of virions, a complete viral particle. So relative size, if we look, here is a yeast cell, so a single eukaryotic cell. Well, two, it's budding here. Yep, where'd it go? This is an E. coli. They're relatively strong, uh, small bacillus, streptococcus, so bacteria, which are significantly smaller than eukaryotes. Viruses come in a whole range of sizes. This is a single hemoglobin molecule here, not a virus. So a single protein is about this big. Well, our viruses have a protein coat, so a whole bunch of proteins that come together to form an outer layer. Um, so they have lots and lots of those. This is about our smallest virus here, um, 22 nanometers. And then poliovirus, a bacteriophage, is a virus that infects bacteria. And then a whole series up to some fairly large viruses that can be bigger than some of the smallest bacteria. But on a whole, they are much smaller than bacterial cells um, or eukaryotic cells. So viral structure, one intact viral particle is called a virion. Um, virion is made of a nucleic acid, so either DNA or RNA, could be single or double, single stranded or double stranded. Uh, it's surrounded by a protein coat. That complete coat is called the capsid, and each capsid is made up of capsomeres, so individual proteins that come together in a very specific arrangement to form this outer coat. And the capsid plus the nucleic acid are called the nucleocapsid. And then they usually have spikes, which are projections from that protein coat through the envelope, if it's an enveloped virus, that are used for attachment. So here are our different components. The capsomeres are the individual proteins that come together to form the capsid which is our protein coat or an outer shell that surrounds and protects the nucleic acid. The nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid plus the capsid. Some viruses are enveloped, um, as you've already started to read about. The envelope is some kind, sometimes called the viral membrane, but it's actually not part of the virus and it's not produced by the virus. The envelope on a virus is a phospholipid bilayer, so it is a membrane membrane that's embedded with glycoproteins, um, those spikes, and surrounds the capsid. Typically where the virion gets that from is it steals that as it leaves the host cell, it grabs some of that membrane and wraps it around it. Um, sometimes for DNA viruses, they might grab part of the nuclear envelope. Again, it's a phospholipid bilayer that's still a membrane that's part of that endomembrane system. Um, or it could grab parts of the endoplasmic reticulum, the membrane there. Uh, but typically we're going to see them grab that as they bud out of a cell on release. And the virion is a 
viral particle. It's a complete infectious viral structure. So one virus, one viral particle is a virion. Viral classification is done in this hierarchical order. First, it's determined what type of nucleic acid it has. Does it have an RNA or a DNA? From there, we look at the specific shape. The viruses have specific shapes. Those capsomeres come together to form either an icosahedral shape, which is those proteins come together to form triangles, and those triangles come together to form that outer shell. So kind of like a soccer ball has um, pentagons and hexagons, shapes that come together to form the ball. These have all triangles. And so it has that outer shell uh, or the capsid is in an icosahedral shape or helical. And in that case, the capsomeres spiral around into a helix. And that's where uh, that's the protein coat that encapsulates the nucleic acid. Uh, and then same thing over here with DNA viruses. The complex viruses we'll take a look at because our bacteriophages are complex viruses. Um, so that's a combination of these shapes. Uh, the next layer of classification is, are they naked or do they have an envelope? So naked or enveloped. And then from there, we differentiate them based on what their nucleic acid is. Do they have a double strand of RNA, a single strand of RNA? And if that's naked or if it's enveloped, is that single strand the positive strand? And here we don't call it messenger RNA or transfer RNA um, because they're coming in with this RNA. So we just give it a designation of positive or negative. The positive RNA would be the equivalent of messenger RNA. It can directly code for a protein. Over here in our, in our enveloped viruses, we see we have a negative. That would be the equivalent of the transfer RNA, but its job is not to transfer amino acids. Um, the host's tRNA is gonna still do that when they start building proteins. But here, it's a single-stranded RNA that has the anticodons for the codons. So it's going to be used as a template. So we can come in with that opposite strand to the one that builds or codes for proteins. And then same here, double-stranded or single-stranded DNA or RNA. Um, here, these are RNA. DS is double-stranded, SS is single-stranded. There's our coronavirus. It is an RNA virus with a helical shape, and it has an envelope and a single-stranded positive RNA strand. So we'll see how that uh, what that means more specifically, that positive strand, when we look at the life cycle. So our variety in our nucleic acids, we can have single-stranded or double-stranded DNA. We can have that strand uh, linear, like our chromosomes, or circular, like bacterial chromosomes. And then the RNA viruses, we could have double-stranded with both a positive and negative, but more often they're single-stranded. Stranded. And we call those the positive sense strand. So the plus strand is ready for immediate translation, would be the equivalent of messenger RNA. Our negative sense strand doesn't have the codons to build a protein. First, it has to be converted to the positive strand. Then that can be translated into a protein. So we're gonna do that by that codon anti-codon pairing. Um, only here, it's just going to be complementary base pairing with those uh, with the nitrogenous bases here coding for their complement to make this positive sense. I um, have segmented or retroviruses. Retroviruses are things like HIV that carry their own enzymes because they can create DNA from RNA. Other organisms, living organisms, don't do that, so we don't have an enzyme that allows us to do that. So they have to have their own enzymes. So part of what their nucleic acid codes for is how to build that protein, that enzyme. Um, and here's just an image with some examples uh, of viruses that are 
single-stranded. So here we have our HIV virus. It's single-stranded RNA with reverse transcriptase. Um, the flu, the common flu, influenza virus, single-stranded with negative polarity, unlike the coronavirus that has a positive RNA strand. Um, small packs is a double-stranded DNA molecule virus. So has double-stranded DNA just like we do. Uh, so how do viruses go about if they aren't able to reproduce? Um, how do they go about multiplying? Well, they take over our machinery in the eukaryotic cell and whatever their host cell is. And how they take over their cycle, their life cycle, how fast do they replicate? What do they do when they replicate? Um, is it has a lot to do with how they're transmitted, what the effects are to the host, what our immune response effects are, uh, and what we're going to do in order to control the spread of that infection. So viruses have two strategies they can use to replicate. We have a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. And the lytic cycle, just think, is something lyses it breaks apart, bursts open. In the lytic infection, the host cell is gonna fill up with newly made virions and it's gonna explode. All those virions are just gonna fill up the cell until they can't hold it anymore and it explodes, resulting in cell death. Uh, the lysogenic infection, these are sometimes called latent infections. They stick around forever. So this, uh, this includes things like herpes, like HIV. And in lysogenic infections, the viral genome becomes incorporated into the host cell's DNA, and it can stay in that DNA. Sometimes it can stay in that DNA and never be expressed and never come out. Uh, you can be asymptomatic forever. You can live with these infections. You just have new DNA. Uh, but periodically, that uh, virus may choose to express its DNA, in which case will convert and go into the lytic cycle. Uh, how this works was first worked out through bacteriophages, our viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, and so these cycles were worked out. There's some slight differences in animal viruses that we'll look at. We'll take a look quickly at our cycles. So I said bacteriophages are complex viruses. This is the icosahedral shape of a virus. And in a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria, we have this top head portion that is icosahedral. And then below that, we have a helical structure. These are both capsomeres. This is all part of that protein coat, but we have both of those combined, so complex. And then their spikes are modified. These protein spikes are modified as anchors. And what they'll do is they'll come and they'll anchor on the bacterial cell wall and then can work like a syringe. And they will inject this tube through the cell wall and insert the nucleic acid into the bacteria. Now this protein coat just falls off of the bacteria um, and the nucleic acid gets to work. So, how it gets to work is first the bacteria, I always think this looks like a little alien landing craft. The bacteriophage lands on the bacteria. Penetration, it injects that nucleic acid into the bacterial cell. And now it takes over the bacteria's machinery for replication uh, and all of the enzymes and it makes copies of its genetic material. So it makes copies of all that DNA that it just, there's the viral DNA, got in here and it started making lots and lots of copies of it. And then it expressed some of that DNA. So and by that, we mean it used that DNA that it just copied to go to the ribosome and make proteins so that it could start assembling new protein coats. And in here we see we have protein coats. We've got the icosahedral component. We've got the helical component. We've got the spikes and we have the nucleic acid. So that's the synthesis. We start building or synthesizing all the pieces, and then we have assembly and maturation. 
Some books consider this one step. Our book calls this assembly. Maturation is when all those parts come together and they come together to form new bacteriophages until we have so many bacteriophages that they burst out. So that's the lytic cycle that was first worked out for bacteriophages, but some bacteriophages actually go into the lysogenic cycle, which is adsorption, penetration, but once that nucleic acid is in here, it just incorporates into the host cell DNA. Every time that bacteria replicates, it makes a copy of its DNA that it shares between two daughter cells, and all of the new daughter cells carry that viral DNA forevermore. Um, and then at some point, that viral DNA might say, hey, let's go get expressed. And it will come out, form a plasmid, and go through replication, or it'll just copy right off the DNA here. When it's copying, it will just express that gene here. And that expression means, oh, I'm going to synthesize all my parts. I'm going to put them all together. And I'm going to keep doing that until I have so many I burst out of the cell. So the lysogenic cycle really is sort of this temporary halt right here. And now I just hang out and get replicated and passed on to new cells. And I may never be expressed, but if I am, I come right back into this lytic cycle and end up with the same end process. So that's in bacteriophages. If we look at animal cells, it's similar. The virion attaches. Um, we have attachment, it enters the host cell, it penetrates and uncoats. So we have to get that nucleic acid out of the uh, protein coat for it to be expressed. So penetration and uncoating. And then that nucleic acid gets to work making new nucleic acids and being expressed into the proteins that will be the capsomeres that will come together to make the protein coats and maturation or assembly until I have so many that I release. So there's my lytic cycle in animals or the lysogenic cycle, which is really just an extra step in here. So I have attachment, penetration and uncoding, ah, but then that DNA just goes and integrates into the host cell DNA. And now it's part of that host cell DNA. Every time that host cell replicates, that viral DNA is replicated. And then at some point, uh, the virus sees an opportunity to be expressed without alerting the host cell immune system, let's say. Um, for example, a herpes virus tend to have herpes outbreaks uh, when your immune system, when you have a cold, calm cold sores, you have a cold, your immune system's busy working somewhere else. Um, and so that herpes virus says, ah, I can spread now while the immune system's busy somewhere else. It's not watching me. And it will come out from the DNA and it'll be expressed. And we'll go through synthesis, build all the parts I need, assembly, make new virions until I have so many that I burst. So similar, uh, similar end point with both of these, but here I can stay in that DNA undetected, not expressing any proteins, not building new virions um, for days, years, weeks, months, a whole lifetime. This is the image that's in the book that goes through that uh, step by step. I will say when you are answering the question in the discussion, number three here are synthesis, which is replication of the nucleic acid and expression of the nucleic acid to make the proteins, the capsomeres for the protein coat, or maybe uh, to make some viral um, enzymes if they are, have to come in with their own enzymes because the host doesn't make the enzyme they need. The example given here is for a positive or sense strand, single stranded RNA. So this will be modified depending on your virus. So for step two, where you have a specific virus to describe, in the first question, you'll just basically describe what goes on here if you're enveloped versus you're a naked um, virus. 
For the second question, you'll take that information. If the virus that you uh, are assigned based on your last name has an envelope, your absorption step and your release step will be different than if you have a naked virus. So that's the first thing that's gonna differ. The second thing that's gonna differ is here, the synthesis step, depending on what your um, nucleic acid is in your virus that you select. So this is a starting point, but on that question number two, you will add specific details based on uh, what your virus is made of. So let's take a look um, at these steps and specifically synthesis. So the lytic infection for animal viruses has those five steps attachment or absorption, penetration and uncoating, synthesis of the virion particles, assembly, we put them all together into new virions and then release. So attachment and absorption, depending on if we have an envelope, um, we may do this through, through endocytosis, specific receptors, that's how the viral particles are specific to specific cells, specific types of cells, is that the receptive cell has to have the right receptors on its coat to match the virus. Um, so it has to be able to attach and then be absorbed into the, uh, into the host cell. So penetration is actually going from, hey, yeah, I'm compatible. I can latch on here, that attachment. Uh, and then we can enter the cell depending on if we have an envelope or if we don't have an envelope uh, in different ways. And uncoding is I have to get that protein off of my nucleic acid so the nucleic acid can go to where it needs to go to get to work. So I'm going to break down that protein code. And then we get to the synthesis step. So this can be complex. This is where we go back to our genetics. Um, so that's where we have to spend some time on complementary base pairing and getting that. It can be complex because the genetics we learned works for all living organisms. We start with DNA, we can replicate our DNA, or we can express our DNA to get a protein. But it's always DNA to RNA to protein. Um, so DNA transcribed into RNA, translated into a protein. Our viruses do all sorts of stuff because they can come in with a single-stranded or a double-stranded DNA or a single-stranded or a double-stranded RNA uh, with either the plus or the minus RNA, things that we never see in other living organisms. So as we go through the synthesis step, it's really important to remember complementary base pairing, complementary base pairing, complementary rate base pairing. Remember A, T, T, A, and DNA. If we go to RNA, A now codes for U from DNA to RNA. And then once we're in the RNA, the complements are uh, U and A and still G and C. So, and then the, tum the template function, where do we go? It's the other thing we gotta have to remember is that complementary base pairing lets us use any one strand of nucleic acid can be a complement for some other strand. So here, my coding strand of DNA is a complement for my template strand of DNA. My template strand of DNA is the complement to my messenger RNA. My messenger RNA is the complement to my transfer RNA. So if I knew my transfer RNA anticodons, I could figure out my messenger RNA because it's the complementary base pairing. If I know my messenger RNA codons, I can figure out the tRNA codons because they're the complements. Um, or I could figure out what DNA it came from because it's the complements. Or I could figure out the complementary strand to the template strand of DNA because I'm just alternating. This, here's its complement. A would code for T, T for A, A for T, so I have T-A-T, -T, 
the messenger RNA is the complement to this. So T codes for A, A for U, um, and T for A. So I would just keep doing that complementary base pairing. Um, so here I would have A, U, A. So here I would have U, A, U. In viruses, I'm going to call this the plus and this the minus, um, but I still have that complementary base pairing. So just like this puzzle, viruses can produce any nucleic acid from having any one of those just because of complementary base pairing and that template function of all of those strands for some complementary strand. So if we go to our uh, viruses and we look specifically at synthesizing. Um, we'll start with the easiest, double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA viruses have exactly what we have. So we have all of the enzymes that they need to do all of their synthesis. They come in with a double-stranded DNA. So here is my, my virus. In this case, this is an envelope here. There's the protein coat and there's my DNA. It's a double strand of DNA. So each one of these strands is a template to build the other. So I can go through replication and get lots and lots of double-stranded DNA. The template strand of DNA will be transcribed to messenger RNA because I need to build proteins. I need to build my capsomeres. And then after I've gone through this synthesis and made lots and lots and lots of capsomeres and lots and lots and lots of my nucleic acid that I came in with, these are going to go through the assembly process, maturation, where the DNA will be put inside of the protein coat that's made of all these capsomeres joined together. And what leaves is a complete virion, millions of complete virions. I made this messenger RNA as a template or as the transcribed DNA so that I could build my proteins. I didn't come in with mRNA. So I'm not going to leave. This is going to be left behind as cellular debris. The only thing that goes into the new virion is what it came in with. What it came in with was that nucleic acid. So that just uses our um, DNA polymerase to replicate the DNA. It uses our RNA polymerase to make the messenger RNA. It uses our ribosomes and our tRNA to make the capsomeres. And voila, it's built. How about if I only came in with a single strand of DNA? So if the virus came in with its protein coat, a single strand of DNA, it would get uncoated. Here, this single strand is the positive or the template strand of DNA. What that does is first it's going to build its complement. This is the sense or this is the template strand. So it could go ahead and build messenger RNA directly. But that would just leave one messenger RNA. This would be a very long, slow process. Um, we use the analogy of the DNA being the entire cookbook and the RNA being a single written out um, recipe. Well, if I had 20, kitchen, 20 chefs in 20 kitchens, but I only had one recipe book and I only made one recipe card from it, it wouldn't matter. It would take me a long time to make 200 cakes. But if I make lots and lots and lots of copies of my messenger RNA, then I can make more. So what I'm going to do is make the complementary base, the complementary strand of double stranded DNA so that I can make more of my template strand of DNA so that I can make lots and lots and lots of messenger RNAs so that I can make these faster. Uh, and then again, whatever I came in with is what I leave with my protein coat, my template strand of DNA, my messenger RNA and uh, non or negative strand of DNA. They're going to go away as cellular debris. They don't get incorporated into my new virion because that's not part of what the original virion was. They were just built to help this process happen faster. All right, so I think you're probably getting the idea here. 
RNA viruses are a little bit different. Uh, for the DNA viruses, I have all of those enzymes because we do all those things. Uh, but in RNA viruses, one of the things that we have to do is build more RNA from RNA. Since we don't do that, uh, we don't have an enzyme that can build a complement of RNA from RNA. Our RNA polymerase only works on DNA. It takes my DNA template, it builds an RNA. We call that uh, DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now we're going to need RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So we need an RNA polymerase that can build more RNA from RNA. Uh, so these are going to have the directions for how to build their own enzymes because they have to come in uh, with those enzymes and start the process. So they carry their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase for the directions to build that in their nucleic acid. So if I come in with a double-stranded RNA virus, a positive strand would be the equivalent of my messenger RNA and a negative strand, um, I'm going to use that messenger RNA to go ahead and build more capsomere proteins. That positive strand is going to build the proteins, but each one of these is going to serve as a template to build more of the other. And so that negative strand, even though it doesn't code for a protein, does give me a template to build more of these. And I need these, the positive strand, to build my proteins. So I use the negative strand of RNA to build the positive. I build, use the positive to build more negatives, because I'm going to need more negatives when I leave and to build the proteins. And then those double strands come together in their protein coat. And that's what we release, the virion that has exactly what the original came in with. So the plus strand in here is already my messenger RNA, the one that tells me how to build the viral proteins. So first I copy that plus strand of RNA into the negative template to make more of the plus strand that will make more of the proteins. That was oh, double stranded. So here's my single strand. So you see it's a similar process. There's my information for how to build a protein. Well, I could build that protein with a single strand of this, or I could make the template that I can now use to make more of my template strand that's going to build proteins so I can build more proteins so I can do this faster because I can't just build more of these. The enzymes won't let me make an exact copy of this. They'll let me make the complementary copy, which is the template. So then I get more and then I get more protein and that all comes together. I could come in with the other strand of RNA, the one that does not code for a protein, but it is a template for the one that codes for a protein. And again, I need my RNA polymerase, my viral RNA polymerase. It's RNA dependent RNA polymerase, because again, our cells never make RNA from RNA. So the new template strand um, will be my messenger RNA, my RNA that builds the protein, and it will be used as the template to make more of the negative strand of the viral genome. So I come in with my RNA strand that doesn't code for a protein, and I use that as a template to build more of the positive strands, its complement, that can then be used as a template to build more of it, of the negative RNA. And it can also be used as messenger RNA to build those capsomeres so what leaves is exactly what came in, the negative RNA, the capsomere proteins, and this positive strand of RNA, this is going to just go away with cellular debris because it's not going to be incorporated into my new virion because it wasn't in it to begin with. Our last type that we're going to look at are retroviruses. So retroviral uh, transcription 
Retroviruses are RNA viruses that contain the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And here's something we definitely don't do, is we never take RNA and make DNA from it. That's backwards from transcription, so reverse transcription uses the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Uh, that converted viral DNA, we start with RNA, we use it as a template to build DNA, and then that DNA can become inserted into the host cell chromosome, and we can go into that lysogenic um, or latent cycle. So HIV is an example of a single-stranded RNA virus with a reverse transcriptase. Uh, there's my RNA. It's got reverse transcriptase. There's directions for some reverse transcriptase on here. It's an enveloped virus. Go through that same yep, adsorption, penetration, uncoding, and then that viral RNA is going to be used to make a strand of DNA. And then that DNA, so that's where my reverse transcriptase comes in. Now I have one strand of DNA. Well, my own DNA polymerase can make the complementary copy to that, uses that as a template, and now I have a double-stranded DNA molecule. My double-stranded DNA can come into the nucleus and integrate into the host DNA um, and stay there until it wants to come out and be expressed. You'll notice this is drawn with two strands of RNA, and I said it's a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, it's considered single-stranded because these are not complementary strands. HIV is very, very efficient because it comes in with two of the exact same strands, and both of these are used to make DNA. Um, so it can make more DNA so that it can make DNA molecules. Uh, it can come into, initially it'll go into the lytic cycle so that it can make lots and lots from that DNA it will go through transcription translation to make more RNA, to make more proteins, to go in the lytic cycle and explode out. Um, so that's where the reverse transcriptase that will obviously have its own enzyme because we don't do that. So this is just a summary of whatever comes in is used as a template, it can be a template to build proteins, it can be as a template to build a template to make more of itself here so that what leaves is what came in. And then we go through assembly, the virus puts all the different parts together and release, uh, re releases from infected cells to go on to infect neighboring cells. Um, the number of virions that are released just depends on the size of the virus how many it takes before it explodes out of the cell. If it buds out at release, um, it will just be a few at a time until eventually we've removed enough of the host membrane that we can no longer have cell integrity, cell falls apart. Um, we, can, we can have lots and lots, poliovirus is really small, 100,000 virions before it'll burst the cell. Pox virus, um, it's much bigger. So it only takes about 3,000 to 4,000 virions to burst out of the cell. And then release, new virions can be released in two different ways. Lysis, if it's not enveloped, I'm just going to keep building new virions until I have so many I bust out. Enveloped viruses are going to steal that virus as they leave. They're going to take that the envelope, not steal, steal the virus, steal the envelope as they leave. So if here's my cell, every time a virus buds out, it takes some of the membrane. That membrane is going to get smaller and smaller until eventually we're going to lose cell integrity. So here's an electron micrograph of budding of these cells stealing. There's my plasma membrane. They're stealing that plasma membrane as they go. And eventually I'm just not going to have enough phospholipids um, to maintain that membrane. Uh, last thing I just want to point out, viruses and cancer. About 20% of cancers, it's estimated, are caused by viruses. These are called oncoviruses. Uh, oncoviruses are viruses that cause cancer. Uh, and they can do that by either carrying genes that directly induce cancer, 
or they can produce proteins that can disrupt the cell cycle um, and lead to cancer. So some examples of some oncoviruses in mammals are papillomaviruses, herpes virus, hepatitis B, and HTLV-1. All right, that gets us through viruses. That should help you answer those discussion questions. Um, play with the viral genetics. Uh, it's really quite interesting. Um, that They play that game that we played, that puzzle. They do that. We did it for fun for a puzzle, but viruses do that as just a normal course of their survival. Uh, all right, so on to week five. Good luck, everybody, and I will see you in the discussions.